Darius. So if it's Darius, Darius, you know what I mean. And he speaks just one in those, uh, the, his message really is four times God used him. And when we look at Zechariah, it's totally opposite of Zechariah. Of all the minor prophets outside of Zephaniah, we have more information on Zechariah's background, which is really important. Because this is, and, and I'll just say this, he comes from a priestly line, and we will see this in a little bit. He comes from a line of priests. I mean, um, he, he, he had a vested interest in the temple. I mean, that was, that was his, I mean, he was a priest first, and then he became a prophet. He was a priest first, and we will see that in the book of Nehemiah a little bit later this morning, Lord willing. So we have this, and Zechariah's prophetic ministry continues over a relatively long time. It starts really between the second and third message that God gives to uh, Haggai, and we will see this in just a minute, is when his first prophecy God gives to him begins. And then we see it, uh, well, let's just look at it. If you were to look at Haggai, let's go to the book of Haggai just for a moment. And I've got mine, I got, oh, look at here, I'm so cool. I've got it, I got it highlighted so I know where I'm going. So, um, but Haggai 1.1, it says, In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, in the first day of the month, came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet. Now, what you see there is their prophecies are dated. They're dated, they're specific in time orientation. Okay, so it was the second year, the sixth month, the first day of the month, this first one came to Haggai. So then you go over to chapter 2, and you see in the seventh month, 2-1, in the seventh month, in the uh, one and twentieth day of the month, or the twenty-first day, came the word of the Lord by the prophet, prophet Haggai, saying, and then you go down to verse 10, you see this, in the four, the four and twentieth day of the ninth month, in the second year, Darius came the word of the Lord by Haggai, the prophet, saying. And then the last one is in verse 20 of chapter 2. And again, the word of the Lord came unto Haggai in the four and twentieth day of the month, saying. So now if you go jump over to Zechariah, which is just a page over here, it begins with this. In the eighth month, in the second year of Darius, came the word of the Lord. We don't know what date it is. Uh, it is believed to be early in the month because later in that verse, uh, chapter uh, verse 7, gives us the second time the word of the Lord. And that one came on the 20th day of that seventh of the 11th month. So, um, well, actually, so we don't know exactly in that. So the eighth month, sometime in that eighth month, many believe it was early in that eighth month. So where did that eighth month come from? Where does that start at? Well, chapter 2 of Haggai, we see the seventh month, and then the ninth month, right between those two is where Zechariah's prophecy begins. So they overlap each other. So they're kind of contemporaries. They are, uh, contemporaries. Now, as we did state before, <clears throat> we did restate that Haggai was probably more fiery and forceful than Zechariah. And um, I, I don't know if it has to do with his age. I don't know why. But it's just that he was focused on one thing. And that was this. Get off your laurels. Get off your duffs and build the temple. I mean, quit building for yourself. Build the temple. It's important. As I was studying this, and I was reading and thinking about this, it's very interesting how God brings about all of this. Returning the captivity to the land. What's the last thing that happens in the Old Testament 
is Nehemiah rebuilding the wall, right? Now, ask you a question. If your country was war torn, okay, let's, let's take, for instance, uh, let's take the Ukraine, okay? Say the war ended today and Russia's defeated and the Ukrainians get to go back into their land. What would you think would be the first thing that they would do? Just, just naturally, what would they do? Rebuild, right? They would rebuild what? The city, the infrastructure, right? When they do the physical thing, getting the city back where it's livable. God's program was completely different. When they went back into the land, he didn't start with the infrastructure. You think about that. What did he start with? Their spiritual well-being. And it comes right back to that verse. But seek ye what? First, the kingdom of God and his righteousness. What, what is, should be our priority in our lives? Building buildings or lands? I mean, I'm thankful, and I mean this sincerely. I, I, I really am thankful that God has blessed us with nice facilities. Amen? And nice, nice place to worship, nice place to congregate. And I'm thankful that we have pastor and deacons that care about this and take care of that. But let me say to you, buildings and this isn't the church here, okay? It, it, it's, you're the church. I mean, that's good for testimony's sake. And I, and I say that because people say, bam, that's, that's nice. And I, I remember when I was at Hillsdale, we had 11, 12 acres of land and 9 or 10. Of, it was a country church and it was a country school. And, and we had about 6, I think we had about 13 acres. We had 6 or 7 acres at the parsonage and 6 or 7 acres at the, at the church. And every week I mowed it all with a tractor and a brush hog. I kept everything up clean. And I had one of the farmers who was kind of messy come to me and say, why are you doing this? I said, this is God's place. When people drive by, I want them to know that this is God's place. I want them to know that we care. But having said that, what is more important? Having nice facilities or people that have a right heart for God? Think about that. I mean, I, I, I think of back years ago, Dr. Ed Nelson back, I'm talking back in the 90s, 80s and 90s, when he went to Russia right after, I mean, and um, he was there with Georgie Benz. I don't know if any of you ever heard of Georgie Benz back in the day. He was um, in prison for many, many years. And Dr. Ed Nelson went over to preach for him. And he showed pictures of them out in the countryside raining and the people were standing in the rain and four guys were holding a piece of corrugated metal over Dr. Ed Nelson so he wouldn't get wet and he preached the word of God. Wow. You talk about dedication. Amen. You talk about people that care. And so the first thing that happened was not the infrastructure being rebuilt, but it was the people's spiritual life being rebuilt. The first thing they did was build an altar. As we said last week, they built an altar. The second thing is they started preparing the foundation. And then things stopped for about 14, 15 years until Haggai and Zechariah came along and gave them a kick and said, you need to get at it. And Haggai, again... He's more interested in, and he, he's, he, assignment from Jehovah was to impel action, get them going, and again, revivalist. But Zechariah's message <clears throat> were directed, his messages, more to the manner and the attitude of the people as they worked. One commentator makes this assessment. The difference between the two prophets seems to be that while Haggai's task was chiefly to rouse the people to the outward task of building the temple, Zechariah took up the prophetic labors here and sought to lead the people to a complete spiritual change. By the way, he led that charge, but you know who finished that charge in that day? Ezra. He led the charge. 
But Ezra finished the charge. So when you think about the return of the captivity, you have three main entities, and we said, it, said this before. You have Zerubbabel, who was the political leader that led that first 50,000, approximately 50,000 people in the first wave. And Ezra's there to build the temple. Then Ezra goes back and brings more people back. And in Ezra's ministry, we realize that he is a scribe. And he's concerned about the word of God. He's concerned about their living. And he really picks up the mantle of Zechariah in really making sure people's lives are changed. And, and, uh, and one of the things that really stuck out to me was, uh, as I read with some material, was that Ezra did this through preaching systematically. He had a system of preaching. And we, we call this kind of expository preaching, you know. And, uh, and that's what our pastor does, Okay. I mean, he's going through the book of Hebrews in an expository, verse-by-verse -verse manner. The beauty of this, and as I said this last week, is God seems to, or not seems, he does orchestrate as, uh, I'm really thankful in this because I've seen it. It's not because of us. It's because God's spirit directs us. When you sit down and say, this is what God wants me to speak on from this passage, it's not like I'm, aha, uh -huh. I see you coming through the door, so I'm going to preach at you this morning, okay? It's not like when you do this, it's a shotgun manner, but it seems like God brings in the people and the needs, and, and it's a timely thing when the people need that the most. It's, it's, it's unbelievable, isn't it, Pastor? You know, you think about that. That's the importance of expository preaching. And so when we look at this and when we see this, he, he, uh, he has this, uh, when, when we unfold, we're going to look at this next week, Zachariah, when we unfold Zachariah and we're going to give an overview, we can't do like Jeff did, go chapter by chapter, or we never get out of the book of Zechariah. We are giving basically an overview, okay? So now... Let's move on. What I failed to mention in the last lesson is that Haggai had a greater positive response than all the prophets before him. Now, I was thinking about this and, and, and really mulling this over in my mind. I, I'm reminded of the rabbi, of what Rabbi Heschel, and I had this in, in one of my earlier, way early messages back three, four years ago. Cons rabbi Abraham Heschel said concerning the prophets, to be a prophet is both a distinction and an affliction. I mean, that, the prophet was a distinctive office, amen? They were God's spokespersons, delivering God's message, God's word. The, 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 I mean, prophecy did not, came by, at prophets as they were what? Move, holy men of God, as they were moved by the Holy Spirit in old times, right? So when we look at this, we look at back at the prophets before Haggai. What do we know about the prophets before Haggai? They came, they prophesied, but what else? And most, a lot of them, they were what? Killed. They were killed. I mean, their message was rejected. So... I put some passages here, 2 Kings chapter 17, Jeremiah 7, 24, and Matthew 23, 31. Up to this point, for the most part, were rejected. In fact, when they spoke their messages, it either fell on deaf ears or hardened hearts. Can you imagine that? Speaking, and God told Jeremiah, be strong. He told Isaiah, be strong, because you're going to go to people that are not going to listen to you. But what do you do? You preach anyway, amen? They're not going to listen to you. This culture is not listening to it. But you know what? We still have to preach it, amen? What's wrong is wrong and what's right is right. And so when you think about this, <clears throat> they were rejected. The response was varied from not believing it could possibly happen 
to downright rejection because of hardened hearts. Now, let me say this to you. Sometimes we in our, we ask ourselves, is it ever going to happen? You ever had that, say that? Is God ever going to change this situation? I mean, if you go over to 2 Peter, and I, I, I'm going off the cuff here for a minute, okay? 2 Peter, if I can remember here. And... Um, Uh, look at Second Peter chapter 3, verse 4, and it says this, And saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For the since the Father fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. You know, there are people who say, It's never going to happen. It's never going to happen. It's never going to happen. Let me say to you, it's going to happen. Let me, let me put it in down-to-earth perspective. As you know, we were five years in between ministries, went through one of the toughest ministries I've ever had in my life in, in Crandon, Wisconsin, and, and uh, got great blessing. But it, it, we had great, oh, I tell you what, God helps you forget a lot of the ugly stuff. You know what I mean? But for five years, for five years, we were in between churches. And I would basically get up every day and ask God, when is this going to quit? When are the, when are the circumstances going to change? And I just don't know. I, I mean, we would get close to be calling, to coming to a church, going to a church to be candidate, get there, and all of a sudden rejected. In fact, we were going to a church here in Michigan, and they had voted to call us. And we, we had given the notices of our job. And all of us, and we hadn't heard from them. And we were getting, we said, where's, what about, they showed us a place where we were going to rent and things like that. And come and said and done, they said, well, the deacons decided we don't want you. And I, I was crushed. I said, when is this ever going to end? And I remember Dr. Olala saying to me, and, and my pastor said, Brother Dana, don't despair. God is faithful. God saved you. God protected you. Looking back at that now, he did protect. And I remember when we candidated at Central Baptist Church in Stevenson, and as we drove out of town and they voted us in after five and a half years I just sat down we had a flip phone then we had to go outside of Stevens because there's no reception until we got reception and I called our kids and said we found a place God has put us in a place and I wrote I wrote down then and said God you didn't forget about me you did not forget about me it was one of the most emotional highs in my life because I realized that God even in those wilderness experiences was with me and there was an end okay there is an end God is going to keep his promises okay so when we look at this and so when the response was varied from not believing it could possibly happen to downright rejection because of hardened hearts However, that was not the case with Haggai. By the way, you ever feel dejected when people reject your message? And I was thinking about this. God keeps bringing up these memories when I go in through this, and I'm saying, oh, Lord, I see this now. But and when our third pastor, when I was in Hillsdale, Wisconsin, family in our church asked me to go visit this lady that was dying in the hospital. She had requested that a pastor come and see her. So, and I didn't know her from Adam. I walked in the hospital room, and her husband's sitting here, and she's here. And I, I um, introduced myself, and and I told her who sent me, and she was happy, and and I got talking to her, and she accepted the Lord right there. And I turned over to her husband. I said, "Would you like to do the same thing?" And he looked with me at the stonest face. No. That's all right for her, but not me. She died. 
And I thought for sure that they would have me to do the funeral. And I got word back that the family did not want me to have the funeral and they didn't even want me to be there. You talk about rejection. I kind of surmised that he had something to do with it. I don't know to this day. But rejection's hard, is it not? But regardless, we have to speak the truth to this culture. We have to go to this culture and say what's right and what's wrong. And so when we come to this, we, when we come to this, the blessing of this was this. The, up to this point, the prophets rejected, but the response was varied. But when Haggai spoke, what did they do? Collectively, they repented and responded. Now, that blows my mind. They, uh, of all the prophets, Haggai had the greatest response from people positively. And as soon as he preached that they needed to repent and get back to work, what did they do? They repented and got back to work. Folks, that's revival. And so last week I mentioned this, that his name was meant festo, festivity, uh, happiness. I thought, you know, I looked at it in an anathetical way. He had to go to these people. That wasn't a happy time. But can I say this? It's happy now. Because what did they do? Repented. I mean, I, when I looked at that, I thought about the prodigal son. When he repented. What a happy time that was for the father, amen? What a change, a 180, okay? And we'll talk more about that a little bit later, okay? So, another th thing that was not mentioned was that Haggai's message came directly from God for Haggai to speak, and that he did. So, when we think about this, I gotta get over to your second page here. Haggai spoke with authority and great conviction fell and they did fear before the Lord. I want to say this. It's not, and well, let's go over to Zechariah. Uh, well, we'll go to Zechariah. And, and the same thing to Zechariah. God said, it's not by power. It's not by, by, by might. It's by what? My spirit, saith the Lord. These men spoke what God wanted them to speak. I as someone says, I can't save anyone, but it's God's conviction that falls and God uses the foolishness of preaching and when the preaching goes out, what happens? God sends conviction to the heart to make the decision. So we are to be faithful in preaching and teaching. Amen? I, when I first started out in ministry, I thought, I don't know if anybody will respond. And I, I had to learn a lesson. It wasn't about me. It's not about me. It's not about oratory. It's not about how, how wonderful I present it. It's when God brings conviction in the heart through the foolishness of preaching that people are changed. I mean, when you look at that first and second chapter of 1 Corinthians, it talks about the foolishness of preaching to to, to uh, the Greek, it didn't make sense. It was moronic is the word there. To the Jews, it was a stumbling block. It was like a catching a hairball in their, in, their, in, their, in their throat because they choked on that, that Messiah was going to die. They couldn't comprehend it. But God said the foolishness of preaching. You know, that's what God uses, Amen. God used the foolish in preaching. So, they did, and here's the response. The Bible says here in 112, they did fear before the Lord. Wow. <clears throat> May I say this? No matter how the vote goes, no matter what happens this year, until people fear God, nothing's going to change. Nothing. Nothing. And you know what? There is no fear. The Bible says in Romans 3.18, there is no fear in their eyes. Folks, there is no fear of God in the eyes of the people of this land. That's why we have to pray that God brings the fear of God to them. Until they have the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And that fear is twofold. And I have a hard time saying this. Not awe, but awe. <laughs> A-W-E, I mean, God's name is trampled on 
constantly in this country. Com constantly trampled on. But then there is this idea of dread. You know, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we what? Persuade men. I mean, people got to realize this. There has got to be this, this thought, okay? So let's go on. As we begin to read the introductory, okay, um, of Zechariah, we see that Zechariah's first prophetic mist, and, and now we're going to go into the transition. As we begin to read the introductory paragraph, verses 1 through 6 of Zechariah, we see that Zechariah's first prophetic message to the people takes place in the eighth month. And we talked about this right between those two prophecies in uh, Haggai. Now, we're going to look this, this morning at uh, some general observations, and then we're going to look at, um, we've got time to look at this idea. We're, go, we're going to look at these first six verses, which, like the first chapter of Ezekiel, like the first chapter of Jeremiah, sets the tone for the whole book. Now, next week, we will, we will be looking at the other um, parts of this book. Now, some scholars divide this book up into six, four, and uh, I have one, one commentator divides it up in six, um, the outline in six different areas here, and I, I like that outline. And we're going to talk about the book itself and what's, we're going to touch on the eight visions of uh, the, those visions. And we're going to talk about some really important prophetical stuff in our message next week. But this, this let's, uh, let's look at some general observations and contents about the book of Zechariah. First of all, the book is first appears to uh, Benny as being intimidating because of all the strange aspects to it. So a lot of people stay away from Jeremiah. I mean, Zechariah, why? There's a lot of symbolism. Where do we see that? <laughs> yeah, Revelation. In fact, it is called the Revelation of the Old Testament. Zechariah is, okay? And so, example given, chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, the flying roll. Now, I've, I've, I've got two takes on this, but... I mean, uh, taken out of context. You know, if you ever go to Lambert's Cafe in Sexton, Missouri. Anybody ever been to Lambert's Cafe in Sexton, Missouri? If you haven't, you need to go sometime. Because it's the home of the throwed rolls. And they use this verse as their text about throwing rolls. The flying roll, okay? So what is this? Well, we, we, we'll see. We'll, we'll kind of look at that. It's not... It's not throwing rolls in a restaurant, okay? Neither is it as one Bible professor talked about who taught Old Testament history and Old Testament prophecy. His students came and TP'd his house and they put on this, on their toilet paper, a flying roll. <laughs> so, you know, it's just like Dr. Bannerman. How many remember Dr. Paul Bannerman? How many remember Dr. Paul Bannerman? Larger in life. Do you remember, do, does anybody remember... What I don't know if it still is, but back in his day, you know what was over the nursery door? The caption, but we shall all be what changed, you know, kind of out of context. Okay, so the flying roll. Okay, so we have all these things visions, symbols, and prophecies of end time eschatology abound in the book of Zechariah. And these are the main ingredients of apocalyptic literature. Okay, now how how does the world look at this word apocalyptic? <laughs> Movies, how do they depict what is the apocalypse is coming? Huh? Destruction. Destruction. But that's not what the word means. It's actually the Greek word for revelation. And that's what it means, the apocalypse of Jesus Christ. If you were to read it in the Greek... It is the idea, the revealing of Jesus Christ. And that's what it means to reveal or to disclose that which has been hidden, okay? So when we come to this, we, we, we'll see this through the book. 
<clears throat> Zechariah Keynes contains both foretelling, as we said before, and foretelling. The foretelling aspect of the book is the prophet's appeal to people concerning their heart relationship to God so that the work of their hands, the temple project, might prosper. The foretelling aspect concerns Israel's fortunes and judgments in years to come. And Jeff often went back to the book of Zechariah when he was going through the book of Revelation, which was very good. Uh, going back there and, and seeing it in the light of Revelation. So, <clears throat> culminating in the nation's glory when Messiah comes. We will be dealing a lot of, after we get done with these books about the kingdom. A lot of people ask about the kingdom and why we are premillennial dispensationalists, why we're not reformed. And they're miles apart what we believe, miles apart from what we believe. And I love them. I mean, I've got friends that are covenant the theology people, but they're wrong. And they'll, they'll realize it. I mean, when they get to heaven, I believe. I, 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 I just, I just, when you read this stuff, how they interpret the Bible, it just, it, it's foreign to me because the way I was brought up, okay? If you were brought up in a dispensational background like I was, I mean, this was just, when the, if it makes sense, you don't, what, seek any other sense, and we'll talk more about that later. Okay, so, and so this is the idea. And there are at least four main purposes that can be found in the book, and there might be more. First of all, to bring about spiritual revival. They needed revival. We need revival. Second Chronicles 7.14 is, we quote that, but do we really pray it and do we really mean it? I mean, we vote heartily, don't we? We kind of campaign heartily to what we want. I want to ask you something. Do we pray heartily? Do we, do we campaign before God heartily? Do, do we do that? Do we really get down and say, God, show me my sin and help me, help me. And I had an evangelist that said, the way of revival begins is you draw a circle around you and you get down in that circle and say, what's wrong with what's inside that circle? And when, when you get done there and then it goes outward it's not like you go out here and, and I say man there's, there's Dennis's sin I need to, he needs to take care of that or Isaac or, or Doug's L listen what I need to do is I need to draw a circle and get on my knees and say what's wrong with Dana what's wrong with me revival begins with us it begins individually not everybody else Oh, you know, <clears throat> I always get a kick out of this. Someone said, oh, boy, I'm glad that people were there. They sure needed that message. And I thought to myself, you need that message too. And I need that message too. It's just not other people, okay? Other people. We need that message. Okay, so we go on from here. And we said, secondly, to inspire the people, complete the temple building. And to comfort and console the people. And to register in divine scripture unmistakable prophecies about the coming Messiah. There are more prophecies of Christ in Zechariah than any other prophetic book except Isaiah. And I just put three of the ten that I come up with. And he's called the servant in 3.8, the branch in 3.8 and 6.12, the king priest, 6.13, lowly king. If you were to read the book of Zechariah and you underline every time it refers to Christ, it, 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 there's so much. Um, as I was studying about the kingdom and as I'm putting all this material together and I'm, I'm thinking, where have I been all these years to think of it? You know, the psalm says, lo, it speaks about me in the book in the volume of the books. Who's that talking about? It's talking about Christ because Hebrews says the same thing. And it says that's Jesus Christ. Everything is about Jesus Christ and God's plan for the and purpose. Oh, I'm going ahead. Got to stop there. Okay, let's go on. The identity and implications of the name. First of all, 
Zechariah's name in Hebrew means Yahweh, and Yahweh means simply Jehovah. The reason they call him Jehovah, uh, Yahweh is they weren't allowed to pronounce Jehovah in Jewish language. They weren't allowed to do that. They, they couldn't do that. So it was Yahweh. And it's just really the vowels. They were, I don't know, it's because of the sacredness of the name. So when you look in the King James Version of the Bible, when we look in our Bible, when you see <clears throat> capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, for Lord, that is Jehovah or Yahweh. Always in the Old Testament. <clears throat> when you see capital L, small O, a small r and small d in our King James Bible in the Old Testament. It is Adonai, which means master. So there's the differentiation, okay? So Jehovah, okay? Yahweh. And so when we think about this, Yahweh remembers. It's a popular name in the Old Testament. And also the John the Baptist father, Luke chapter 1. And Zechariah's name proclaims a theological message about God and his relationship with Israel, does God remember? Again, let me say to you, God is not done with Israel. God has a plan for Israel. God has a plan for the church. God has a plan for the Gentiles. And that's all part of the dispensational scheme we are not, the church is not in the Old Testament, people. Get that through your head. It's not there. Jewish. And God has not permanently set aside the, the Jews. I mean, Paul explains that. How, how Reformed people can't see that, I don't know. God's got a future plan. I mean, and, and they try to allegorize and they try to spiritualize all this just happened. This all took place already. No, 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 no. Come on. This is futuristic. We believe that this is future. Future. And folks, there's going to be a real kingdom and a Messiah sitting on the throne and there's going to be a plan for Israel in the, in the kingdom and there's going to be a plan for the church and there's going to be a plan for the Gentiles all in the kingdom. A physical kingdom. And we'll talk more about that a little bit later. Every time Zachariah's name was mentioned was a negative reminder of the people's lack of faith. Consistently reminded the nation that God had made a covenant with Israel, binding covenant that God would surely keep. Of course, that covenant is the Abrahamic covenant. God said that people will never be destroyed. The enigma today is that nations come and go, but Israel will always be there. Always. Never be wiped out, okay? And so we have in this day and age, if you look at Israel and you see the speck and you see all the Arab nations around them and all the nations around them that are anti-Semitic, and guess what? We are in the battle for with anti-Semitism even in this country and even with religious leaders that are anti-Semitic. They hate the Jews. I can't understand it. But God said it would happen, okay? So we go on from here. Zechariah is a constant reminder that what we should do and what we do do, what we do are miles apart, you know? A constant reminder that God is faithful when we are not. I'm so glad. It's great. I mean, when you get back in Lamentations, what did Jeremiah come to the conclusion, even know that everything had been destroyed. Great is thy what? Faithfulness. What did Habakkuk say? If there's nothing in the said, nothing in there, God's still faithful. Amen? He's still faithful. <clears throat> the book of Zechariah begins by introducing the prophet's ancestry. Zechariah descended from a priestly line. Before Zechariah was a prophet, before Zechariah was a prophet, he was a priest. He was a prophet priest, like Ezekiel and Jeremiah. 
Before him, Jewish tradition honors Zechariah as a priest of the great synagogue, responsible for gathering and preserving the sacred writings and traditions of the Jews after the Babylonian exile. Go over to me, with me just for a minute to Nehemiah chapter 12, I believe it is. Back in your Bible. If I got the right passage here, hang on. I got to get over to Nehemiah. Ezra, Nehemiah. I think I got to write. Oh, yep. Okay. Uh, Look at verse 16. No, no, look at verse 1 here. Now, these are the priests and Levites that went up with Zerubbabel, the son of Shetil, and Joshua, who is the, it says Jeshua, but it means Joshua, who was the high priest. So, notice who went up. There was, there is these people here, but look down in verse 16. Of Ido, who? Zechariah. Now, we, we see this, and in, in, in look at Zechariah 1. We see this. It says, unto Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Ido, the prophet, saying. So when you go to Ezra, it talks about the, he's the son of Ido. It's kind of a Jewish thing, and you see this all, in, even in the book of Daniel. Ido was his grandfather. Berechiah was his father. Simple as that. It's kind of confusing because it says of Idol. But it is the idea that he's the that his grandfather. Now this is kind of interesting. This is kind of interesting here. Um, what this is. And um, I, I, I want you to see this this morning. <clears throat> he was descended by listing multiple generations who enjoyed God's covenant of blessing in the past suggests that prophet embodies the assurance from God that the people of God will enjoy a secure future full of the promises of God. So there is a play on the meaning of the words. Now listen to this. This is kind of unique. So the name Berechiah means God will bless. Okay? And it all means God's appointed time. And Jeremiah means what does Jeremiah mean? I mean, Zechariah mean again? It means that God remembers, right? So you put them together. God remembers and God will bless in what? His own time. What a thought about that is. I mean, God, God puts this there. God's got a plan. Stick with it. Don't vary from it. Don't worry. God's got it. Amen. And we, it, man, that's a, that's a reminder of us too. God, God remembers, and God's got a plan, and in his old time, he will do what? <coughs> he will fulfill it. Simple as that. And so we, we need to realize that. Now, coming down to the verses two through six, let's read this real quickly, and then we'll talk about this for the next 10 minutes, and then we'll, we'll be closed. <clears throat> And here he said, here's, here's the introduction to the book, and here's really the bedrock of the book. The Lord hath been sore displeased with your fathers. Now, it was as simple as that. God was not happy with their forefather. Therefore say they all unto them, thus saith the Lord of hosts, turn ye unto me, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will turn unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. Be not as your fathers unto whom the former prophets have cried, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Turn ye now from your evil ways. And that word turn ye means to return. And from your evil doings, but they did not hear and hearken unto me, saith the Lord. Your fathers, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? No. But my words and my statutes, which I've commanded my servants, the prophets, did not they take a hold of your fathers? Listen, even though they rejected the message of the prophets, 
Did those prophecies come true? Absolutely. So when we look at this, like as unto the Lord of hosts thought to do unto us, according to our ways and according to our doing, so he had dealt with us. So here's the admonition, and it's an admonition to repent. It is the word return. It is turny, turny means return. It's the key word in the Old Testament. It's a verb, and it means to repent. It means you're going in one direction, and that direction is wrong. So um, this baloney that God, I know people, not here, but people out there somewhere are going to be mad at homosexuality is wrong. They can't worship God until they what? Repent. And if you go to 1 Thessalonians, you see that there were homosexuals that repented in that church. Some of you were this. And they repented and God what? Saved them. And, I, and this is really a hard thing because we live in this world today that it's closing in on us just like it has Canada. You cannot in Canada get up and preach against homosexuality in Canada. It's been that way for several years now. I had a missionary friend. Uh, he's now home with the Lord. And um, he talked about how careful they had to be when we brought kids in the camp and stuff about handling this because if the government got a hold of it, they would be shut down and put out of business and everything else. Wow. Can you imagine that? And folks, it's coming here to the, it's coming here. It's coming here. That's why we should be on our knees praying and asking God to do something unbelievable in our country. Repentance. <clears throat> and so it is the idea it means you're going one direction and that direction is wrong. So you make a 180 and turn around and go back to where you should have been going. And I, again, I come back to the prodigal. He went off in his own direction, right? And it wasn't until he got down to the pig pen that the Bible said that he came to himself and he did what? He realized that he was going the wrong way. And he said, I need to go back where? To the father's house. Even though I'm not even worthy to be a servant, and that was his attitude. And by the way, that's the humbleness of repentance. I don't deserve this, but God, I need this. I need to repent and come back to you, okay? And when he does, oh, we read about, we read about the father who was out of characteristic. They never ran to mean anybody, but he ran to meet his son. And folks, that's a picture of God, how God runs to meet us. When we turn to him, he turns back to us. You know, when they went into idolatry, they were estranged from God. But likewise, God turned his back on them. And now they're repenting. And now we have this reconciliation. And by the way, that's what the atonement's all about. It means at one moment. It, in the New Testament, the word for atonement is reconciliation. What makes reconciliation for our sin? The atoning blood of Jesus Christ. Aren't you glad of that? He's the one that paid for that. Now, there is there's an interplay between the prophets and God. When they did listen to the prophets, they, um, when they did not listen to the prophets, they were not listening to God. God gave the word to the prophets and they were faithfully proclaimed the word. The pr true prophet did not say what he wanted to say, but rather said what God wanted him to say. <clears throat> you know, um, when I first started out in pastorate, I had a man every time we go to the pulpits. Not every time, but a lot of times he said, please don't embarrass us and slaughter the king's English when you get up there. That's what he said to me. And I was timid and young, and I came across this verse. The fear of man bringeth a snare. The fear of man bringeth a snare. Folks, we need to fear God and not men. And that's where we're at today. And a false prophet would stand up and say what you wanted to hear, but a true prophet would stand up and say what God wanted him to say. 
And that's the same with a pastor. We live in a day where Timothy said that people will look for people that speak and tickle their ears. That's not right. God wants us to be, to speak the word of God with authority and truth, lovingly. I mean, Ephesians 4.15, speak the truth in love. We're not here, I'm, I, I'm not speaking the truth because I hate you. I'm speaking the truth because I love you. And I don't want you to go to hell. I do want you to repent. I do want you to know the God I know, right? Amen? Let's pray. Brother Richard, would you dismiss us and we'll, be, we'll go from here. Thankful to be able to be here with our brothers and sisters in Christ, Lord. I just uh, I'm so thankful to be able to freely, openly study your word. Lord, just help us to take it to heart in our minds. Help us to follow you and serve you. And just so thankful for uh, this body of believers, Lord. Bless them and, and help them and help us. And I pray that you'd uh, bless the next service, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Any comment or any? Right now. Anybody? We got two minutes, so anybody? Anybody? Okay, you're dismissed.